when she saw that it was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, now that's two things, good for the taste and it was good for the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, so she was told, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. What happened? What happened? Go ahead, tell me what happened. She influenced her husband to do wrong? What happened to both of them as soon as they did it? Okay, spiritually they died. What happened immediately? What did they discover? Now, I'm not going to go into a long discourse of what that means. Uh, I have my ideas, but because they were robed with a robe of light, apparently they lost it. They were no longer sacred and holy. They lost their robe of light, so suddenly they're unclothed. They see themselves in a way that they had never seen themselves before. Hmm. So, actually, what's interesting is there was an... But before it was a... Is this something common to life? Is there anything in life that does not follow this? That principle is so big, it is so common, it is, it is so much a part of life that an entire religion is built on it. Karma in Buddhism. I want to read a statement to you. Buddhism is a non-theistic philosophy. What is theistic? God. It's a non-God philosophy. So Buddhism in that sense is not a religion, but they've made a religion out of it because that's their whole life. We do not believe in a creator, but in the causes and conditions that create certain circumstances that come to fruition. We've observed in life, in nature, that there are causes that create effects, fruition. This is called karma. Okay? It has nothing to do with judgment. There is no one keeping track of the karma and sending us up above or down below. Karma is simply the wholeness of a cause or first action. Its effects and fruition which then becomes another cause. In fact, one karma causes can have many fruitions, all of which are caused thousands more of, creation, of creations. Just as a harm, handful of seed can ripen into a full field of grain, a small amount of karma can generate limitless effects. Now, my point here is this. Do you believe that's true? Is this a principle that God created into the universe? Absolutely. Why do you think then that the gospel says what it does? Where am I going? A lot of Christianity today, and again, Linda, I would point out, not necessarily the individuals, but the theology of many denominations today is actually teaching that it doesn't matter. If you are born again, you made a decision one day to accept Christ, automatically, this goes away. Well, that's really what their theology is saying. If you've accepted him, you will be saved, period. Doesn't matter what you do, it has no effect. Live like hell, but because you chose him, you were born again one day, you can live like hell and reap heaven. Doesn't that violate all of nature? It doesn't work that way. It what? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We all know that. And yet somehow Christianity is trying to put this over on 
all of its adherents that just accept him and now it doesn't matter how you live it doesn't matter what you choose it doesn't matter whether you pray that much or not or you study it just doesn't matter effect doesn't follow cause is really what they're saying Deuteronomy 7 verses 6 to 12 this is basically the story of the gospel in the Old Testament. I want you to think about this and think as we read it, how much of the principles of this are still true in the remnant New Testament church? Are the principles still the same? Here we go. Verse 6, Deuteronomy 7. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. Is that true so far? Are we are to be a holy people to our God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people or a person for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because you would keep, because he would keep his oath, which he had swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you. Now, may I paraphrase just a little bit? You watch what's written there, and I'm going to paraphrase. He has redeemed you from your personal house of bondage, from the hand of your personal pharaohs that kept you enslaved. Therefore, know the Lord your God. He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenants and mercy for a thousand generations and those like you who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with a person who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments the statutes and the judgments which I commanded you today to observe them. Here's the cause. Here's what you're to do. Okay? Then, here's the effect, verse 12. Then it shall come to pass because you listen to these judgments, keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. Isn't that the gospel today? This new dispensation, the old dispensation, they're the same one with a minor change. One looked forward to the Savior, the other one can see Him by looking back. That's the only difference. We are still commissioned to create certain causes by making the right choices because they lead to results, effects. This is the fruition.